The landscape of the real estate market is evolving and changing every single day right now. Since 2018 is that we were in a market bubble and that things were bound to shift. And you and I don't want to go out and build houses and do other stuff. We make profit to service a bank loan. We want that, lo that money that we profit to go into our pockets. Affordable housing is needed across the entire board of over 85%. Sitting here in September of 2023, most people want to know what the investment landscape looks like for real estate and how they're going to be either affected or benefited from that landscape. And one of the big things that I've been telling people since 2018 is that we were in a market bubble and that things were bound to shift. And now we're sitting in the forefront. We're staring at commercial real estate right in the face. And everything that commercial real estate is telling us is stop because there is a gloom and doom aspect to everything that's happening in the commercial real estate market. Or is it everything? And it's not everything. It's actually just specific sectors. But those specific sectors are really pulling and weighing down on the commercial market sector and financial institutions and banks. These are the big contributors to why banks are under such financial stress right now. And the number one leading asset class that's pulling banks into stress is office. These big, massive office buildings and retail, these big, large malls that are sitting in financial distress are really weighing and pulling down on banks right now, and it's really affecting the commercial real estate sector. So much so that it's putting stress on other commercial sectors that are in less distress or in no distress because of what's happening in banking. So take this for example. You take a massive portfolio of office buildings nationwide that banks have on their books, billions upon billions of dollars. And you put a vast majority of these under financial distress that's weighing down on your financial sector. One of the big things that's happened is that the pandemic, the global pandemic, it pulled all these people out of office into their homes. And then all of a sudden, these people don't want to go back to the office. And so you have all these massive buildings and real estate that are empty without people that are filling them to actually work within these offices. And people just haven't went fully back to work in the office sector setting. And we don't know if they ever will, but it's put investors and developers in financial distress, then putting more downward stress on the banks. Now, when the banks are in financial distress, they readjust. When they readjust, it lands up affecting all of the market sectors. So two of the largest, most progressive market sectors in the commercial space right now is multifamily and warehouse. Those two sectors are the two sectors to pay attention to in regards to their strength over the long haul in the near future. Because what's happened in the market right now is still putting even financial distress on those two sectors. Let me give you a few examples to explain to you how those sectors are getting affected. Because people will sit back and say, I thought there was a housing need. I thought that we, we needed housing. If we truly need housing, then why is it that multifamily, single family houses are starting to feel the effects of what's happening in the banking sector? Well, when the banks get tight on money, they just don't get tight on the assets that, they've let, that they're lending on that are in financial distress. They get tight on all asset classes. And so they have to restructure their books to be able to take advantage of what's happening in the overall market as a whole. And so when interest rates go up, as we've seen over the last uh, 18 months, then it, money becomes more expensive. So developers and the risk for investors becomes a lot higher. So it lands up making the development, the asset class less desirable for returns on investment and the risk versus reward factor also puts that in jeopardy as well. So one of the big factors for like multifamily is you sit back. Now we used to be able to go in and get an 80% loan to cost to build the asset or an 80% loan to value on, a, on an established, finished, stabilized asset. Now we're looking at loans as low as 55% loan to cost, meaning that the developer and the investors have to come up with 45% of the capital to be able to build these assets. Now, when you look at it from a capital perspective where money is already tight, the stock market isn't doing great, a real estate isn't doing great, and now you take people where they have their vast majority of their invested capital in real estate and in the stock market, and they're not able to draw on that to invest in these new assets being built, it puts downward stress on the developers to be able to go in and actually fund these developments to get them finished. Now, one of the big things when this happens is not only do the developers fill it from the private money a draw that's not available to them and what was available to them in one other given time just a, a short year and a half, two years ago, 
But what ends up happening is the banks themselves, because they're pulling down, even though they're at a 55% loan to cost, guess what's happened to values as cap rates have continued to climb up to meet the, um, to meet the financing needs of interest rates. Values drop. And here's the caveat that most people don't even realize. I was just at a meetup event down in Dallas, Texas, and I asked everybody, how many people in this room? There was 80 people in that room. And I said, how many of you folks know how to evaluate values based on cap rates? And I had three people out of 80 that knew how to evaluate the value of an asset based on the current market cap rates. Three out of 80. And these are people that are already investing in real estate ladies and gentlemen. So if you're new to this, you're looking at this video saying, Jerome, I want to invest in real estate. I understand that there is opportunity in times of financial distress. I'm telling you, yes. But first invest in educating yourself as to how to underwrite and understand how real estate is looked at from private money, from private sector money to public sector money on the banking side and the private sector side from investors. Now, look, one of the big things right now is that in spite of multifamily being very attractive and the need for, for rooftops all over the place and industrial warehouse being in massive need for all, the for all of the distribution of online orders and sales that are happening along with data centers and the increased need for data and tech, it, in spite of that, banks are putting downward pressure on investors and developers, making them obligated to bring this capital to the table. Now, if you don't understand how banking is work and how money is actually a contributor to what's happening economically with the expense of money, money being more expensive because debt is more expensive. So when debt is more expensive, the cost to get that money as a loan on credit is a lot more expensive. And so when it's expensive to get money, it, it, it's all a, ra a downhill landslide going from the top down to the bottom, meaning the people that are coming in pouring the foundation to your house, the people that are putting the plumbing supplies in it, the stucco finishes, the windows, the trim out, the electrical fixtures, all of those people see the downward effects of inflation when money becomes expensive. And the reason why is because it costs everybody money when money is expensive because most companies don't function in the black. Most companies function in the red. So take a company like Tesla for sake of example, um, where this company, the stocks, are all moving upwards. They're EBITDA positive, meaning they're growing as a financial, they're growing as a business and their finances continue to grow. They're EBITDA positive, but they're still functioning in the red, meaning that they don't have profits. The company's growing exponentially, but their profits don't meet what they're actually growing towards. So that money is serviced through debt. And when debt becomes expensive, guess what happens to the end consumer? They land up paying for that on the end price of products, goods, and services. That's you and I, okay? Now, how does this all affect to real estate? Well, one of the biggest things and how it's contributing to real estate right now and what's happening in the market in office space and this downward pressure on banks is that the cap rates are having to meet the need of the high interest rates. So what a cap rate is, is it's the amount of money you make if you invest into a specific asset. So if you go in and you invest in a multifamily asset, they tell you, we're, we're doing a 3% cap rate on it. That's your cash on cash return. That means if you put that, if you paid for that asset all in cash, you would be making 3% on your money back. Okay. Not a lot of money, but when it's at a 3% cap rate, it actually makes the value of that asset exponential. It makes the value of that asset look extremely, extremely attractive. So over the course of the last uh, three to four years with the pandemic passing, Values have skyrocketed because cap rates have compressed. Now, the caveat to that is the opposite effect of expensive money. Cap rates compressed. Now, cap rates are starting to go back up to meet the expense of debt. Because if you only make 3% on your asset, but yet the debt on that asset is 6%, who fills the, less, the rest of that 3% gap? You and I as investors. But none, you and I don't want to go out and build houses and do other stuff. We make profit to service a bank loan. We want that, lo that money that we profit to go into our pockets. And so, ladies and gentlemen, one of the big things right now is that as cap rates rise with the, in, with the rising interest rates, guess what happens to the value of that asset? It drops exponentially as, the, as cap rates actually go up. And most people don't realize that. And they say, how can that be true? Well, the definition 
of, of how you, or the formula of how you figure out value from cap rate is the, the net operating income, the amount of money that asset comes in, meaning that nothing's changed. It's the same asset, same structure, same walls, same apartment, same everything, same rent rate, same everything. Everything is identical. It's exactly the same as it was when the market was up here and the cap rates were down here. And now that the market is teeter-tottering and cap rates are, raising, are rising with interest rates, what's happening is those values land up dropping because when, when the market shifts as hard as it has, the, the, when the cap rates, the net operating income is the same. But if you divide out the cap rate on it because it's net operating income divided by cap rate equals value. Okay, so net operating income divided by cap rate equals the value of the property. That's what the banks look for. So when you take a, a net operating income of $100,000 and you do a multiplier on a 3% cap rate and that property is worth someplace in the neighborhood of just shy of $3 million, guess what happens when that cap rate rises to 6%? Divide it out, get a, cap, a calculator, take that same $100,000 in net operating income for the year and divide that by 6%, now you're at like just over 1.5% uh, $1.5 um, million dollars in asset value. It's cut in half. Your value of that asset has cut in half based on just the cap rate alone. No other variable factor. So understand, ladies and gentlemen, when you're sitting back going, where does all this opportunity come from in these gloom and doom days of the real estate market taking a beating right now with, with raising interest rates? Listen, the opportunity comes where people can't refinance those assets because investors are stuck with devalued properties, high interest rates, and expensive debt that they can't service because the cash flow doesn't meet the, the availability of financial stress that the interest rates are putting on that asset can't be serviced and paid. And so bankruptcy start become, becoming real. Foreclosures start becoming real. And relationships with bankers and brokers that have inside knowledge, knowing knowledge of these debts being due are really important to have. And the reason why is because those are the folks that get first word that these assets are in financial distress. And when they get word that these assets are in financial distress, the banks also give them a heads up that they're willing to take an equity cut off those assets in order to be able to pad their bottom line and be able to keep that assets off of their bankruptcy and REO list because that looks bad to the FDIC and the bottom line of their financial sector. So if they're able to keep that asset on their books and they're able to just go out and reassign that loan to a different investor at a lower interest rate and a lower valuation and they shave, they're able to write off 30% or 20% of the equity spread that they have invested in that long term, they'll gain that back on interest payments over the course of time. And so ladies and gentlemen, that is where opportunity lies in the commercial market sector today in September 2023. We expect to see at least two more interest rate hikes over the next few months before we get to the end of the calendar year of 2023, which is going to put downward pressure on the commercial market sector even more. Now, how do you position yourself to win? I have videos, ladies and gentlemen, on how we've structured our investments in not only the single family market sectors of buying land and building houses, I'm actually sitting at one of them right now, and how we actually invest in buying land, building houses, and generating six-figure profits. In spite of what's happening in the market today, there's people in the upper 24% of our demographical um, area that actually are doing well financially and have financial security because they've been working a 30-year career and they're sitting in a really good place. Now, with that said, in the commercial market sector, we've built a, we've built a business model that services affordable housing. And right now, more than ever, than ever, what's needed in our market? Ask yourself that. From everybody that's doing well to people that live just below the, um, the average median and even into the poverty level, affordable housing is needed across the entire board of over 85% of home buyers across the United States. And so if you can fo focus on servicing the demand, the demand of those folks, it's where you can position yourself to win. But there's a, a specific factor on how you do that. I'm going to post two videos here at the end of this one. I'm going to give you some recommendations on some multifamily development, ground up business models on what we execute. And one of them on buying land, building houses in this crazy market 
that we're still doing today and understand how to profit from it. Ladies and gentlemen, if you like this content and want more just like it, click and subscribe to our YouTube channel and smash that thumbs up button. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.